Good evening. I'm Josette Severin with Broward County's Mobility Advancement Program. I'm excited to present to you our first public meeting for the Low Stress Multimodal Mobility Network Master Plan. Here tonight, Christina Furman with Marlin Engineering will present to you tonight's presentation. Thank you, Josette. Good evening. My name is Christina Furman, and thank you, thank you to all who has joined us for tonight's evening session on the Low Stress Multimodal Mobility Network Master Plan. Before we begin, I just want to point out that we will be running a few polling questions. Uh, for those of you attending online, the information is dropped in the chat for slido.com. And for those of you attending here in person, uh, the information is available on the screen. The Slido number is pound 2001-504. All right, so before I begin, I wanna do kind of a formal introduction of myself. My name's Christina Furman. I'm a born and raised Broward County resident. I've lived all over the county, very familiar with it. Um, I wanna introduce my team today. Jeff Widener, the deputy project manager, assisting with this project. We also have Catherine Marinace, our strategic planner. Laura Posterini, she is our newest member to the Marlin team. She is our senior planner. We also have Justina Hicklin, who is with uh, the Velaren Group, our sub consultant um, taking the lead on public engagement and outreach. And I also wanna thank all the other team members for assisting with this project. Um, we couldn't do that, the work we do without them. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just real quick here. Uh, Broward County does comply with the 1964 Civil Rights Act and does not uh, discriminate based on race, color, national origin, age, sex, religion, disability, or family status. Um, if you have any questions regarding this policy, you can contact Avril Dorsett, whose information is on the screen. Meeting logistics for tonight. This meeting is being recorded. List, uh, virtual attendees will be placed in listen-only mode throughout the presentation. Any comments or questions will be addressed after the presentation. Some rules of engagement for those of you in person, we ask that you hold off on any questions or comments until the end of the presentation. And we also ask that you silence your phones and other devices uh, for the duration of this meeting. Participants are encouraged to provide your key comments and feedback. For those of you attending online, we ask you to drop your comments and questions in the chat box. Members of our team are online, uh, ready to assist. And for those of you in person, again, we will be answering questions after the presentation. So our format for tonight, um, we're gonna have our presentation and then we'll open it up for public comments. And then uh, we'll have an open house where we will have an exercise for you all. For those of you in person, we've got some maps to take a look at and provide comments and feedback. And for those of you online, uh, we have a crowdsource map that we'll be sharing with you at the end of the presentation. So tonight's agenda, we're gonna do a quick project overview, what the project is, what it entails, the goals of the project, as well as the existing conditions, uh, discuss the needs assessment, talk about the next steps, and then open it up for public comment. So let's begin, shall we? So this is a multimodal transportation master plan for Broward County. Our project entails seven tasks. Task one and task two will be ongoing throughout the present, uh, excuse me, throughout the project. Uh, we just wrapped up our existing conditions analysis. Uh, we're in the middle of our needs assessment. Once we complete our needs assessment, we'll be able to move on to a feasibility analysis we also have a design manual that I'll discuss a little bit about tonight, and then the final report. So our vision statement, and this is a draft vision statement, feel free to give any comments or feedback, but it's to create an inclusive, low stress, multimodal transportation network for all ages and abilities in Broward County. Our purpose and goal is to enhance accessibility and mobility for all through educational, economic, and social opportunities. 
There's a graphic on the screen showing your standard one mile suburban block here in Broward County. The yellow lines depict your six to eight lane arterial roadways. And within those, those one mile blocks, you have your collector streets that are typically two to four lanes and then your neighborhood streets. And really the goal is to create an interconnected system of facilities so people can walk, bike, and use personal mobility devices. And when I say personal mobility devices, I'm talking about wheelchairs, canes, scooters, skateboards, unicycles, e-bikes, uh, the full gamut of, of what's available out there today. So one of the biggest challenges our team will have to provide solutions for is crossing these large arterial roadways. And so that's kind of the purpose and the goal of, of this master plan is creating this interconnected system so that folks can travel in between and within their communities. Our foundation principles for this master plan, safety, comfort, convenience, and inclusiveness. So I've been throwing around this, this term low stress. Uh, low stress networks or low stress facilities emphasize low speed transportation with the perception and reality of safe travel for motor vehicles. They allow folks to travel in between and within neighborhoods, communities, and destinations, and they can be used by people of all ages and all abilities. So let's begin with low stress bicycle facilities. So over the last few years, um, there's been a lot of studies out there to understand how we can get people to, to bicycle. And what we found was that most people fall into what's called the interested but concerned group. They represent almost 60% of the population and in some communities higher or lower, but they are the individuals that will typically use a shared use path, a side path or a separated bike lane. And in a national survey that was conducted a few years ago, 44% of respondents said they would ride their bike if separated facilities were provided. And then you've got another bicycling group called the somewhat concerned folks. And these are the folks that are typically younger and able-bodied and they're able to, and they, they feel semi-comfortable riding in a buffered bike lane or a regular bike lane next to traffic. And then you've got your hardcore enthusiast cyclists. And those are the guys that you, and gals that you see in Lycra on A1A riding 30 miles. And they typically represent about 5% of the population. Our target user for this master plan is that interested but concerned group. Those are the folks like you, or excuse me, myself, and, and maybe some of you out, out there in the audience. Um, I personally don't feel safe or comfortable riding in a bike lane next to traffic. And I, when I do ride my bike, I will ride on the sidewalk, um, but oftentimes on a safe, separated, comfortable facility. So some examples of low stress pedestrian facilities. We've got some good examples here in South Florida. A Middle River Trail that runs along a canal. It's a nice meandering pathway. It provides some shade in some parts of the trail. There's seating, there's benches, there's trash cans and other amenities. And it's a nice wide pathway that can be used by bicycles and pedestrians. We also have the Coral Springs Art Walk in the, in the downtown Coral Springs. And this actually used to be a canal that the city culverted and created this nice long pedestrian promenade. And the, the city does a really great job of activating this space by hosting farmers markets and various other community events. And then in the city of Hollywood, they completed their complete streets project for Hollywood Boulevard in downtown. And it, what it did is it reoriented the roadway and it provided facility, a buffered bike lane for, for bicyclists, a nice wide median with landscaping and trees and sidewalks, parallel parking, and then as you can see, nice wide sidewalks for people to walk along. And they recently finished the last leg of this project, which included some nice big shade trees. So when they grow out, it'll be a nice comfortable experience for people there. Here's some additional examples of bicycle facilities, low stress bicycle facilities in Miami Beach. 
uh, near their conference center, they've got a nice bike lane painted green and they have a semi protection using what's called armadillo or zebra delineators. And West Palm Beach, there's a nice wide shared use pathway right along Okeechobee Boulevard. You can see it on the photo on the screen there. Um, you can see also on the screen that the pathway does delineate bicyclists and pedestrians so that they both can use it. And in the photo as well, you can see some nice big shade trees that were installed right next to the pathway to provide a bit of a buffer and separation between motor vehicles and the pathway. But when they grow out, they'll also provide a nice comfortable um, covered walkway. So here's some examples of the existing conditions here in Broward County. We've got a photo of a sidewalk that's pretty badly broken up. And as you can imagine, anybody with a disability or, or has a, a difficulty with any type of mobility would have a difficult time navigating this sidewalk. What you don't see in the photo is right behind me in that when I took that photo, uh, the sidewalks actually all crumpled up. So if somebody was in a wheelchair, unfortunately, they would not be able to utilize the sidewalk. And then <clears throat> the other photo I have on the screen is along Wiles Road, and you can see a painted bike lane. And this road, if I'm not mistaken, it's probably about 35 miles an hour. It's right next to traffic. It's about a five foot bi uh, bike lane, not very safe, not very comfortable, and not super convenient. Um, some other photos I have on here, we've got a sidewalk to nowhere. Um, you know, this, this sidewalk doesn't connect to anything that doesn't connect to another sidewalk. It just kind of stops. And so again, if somebody has any type of mo mobility issues, they'd be forced to walk into the street in this instance. And then other times what we see prevalent as well is obstructions in the sidewalk. So sidewalks with poles, signage, power poles, lights, things like that, that, that make it really difficult to navigate. And as I'm sure you can imagine, um, you've seen similar things out there, you know, driving around or walking or biking in your communities. And then that top picture there, that's of University Drive in Pembroke Pines. You can kind of see that, that there's somebody standing in the middle of the median waiting to cross this six lane arterial roadway. You know, you've got six lanes for vehicles, and then you've got this little tiny five or six foot wide sidewalk. So these are the type of conditions that exist today that we want to try and correct and, and improve. So now that I've talked about low stress and low stress facilities, uh, let's talk about level of traffic stress. So level of traffic stress is an evaluation method that's used to measure the level of stress a person may experience when using a bike lane or sidewalk or shared use path. And so level of traffic stress is rated on a scale from one to four, one being the most comfortable. And this is typically the level that, that children can use and folks with a disability or in a wheelchair can use. And then four being the most uncomfortable. And this is typically tolerated by folks that absolutely have to use the facility or that are hardcore cycling enthusiasts if they're bicycling. And then that for those people walking, this might be a facility that's not very comfortable, it's not very wide, and it may be impassable. Maybe there's uplifting sidewalks or the obstructions in the sidewalk, uh, but typically a level of traffic stress four um, cannot be used by somebody with, with a wheelchair, or it may be very difficult. So why are we doing this? Well, the population is changing, right? Broward County has almost 2 million residents. We're becoming more urbanized. We're becoming more multimodal. Today, our seniors represent about 18% of the population and are expected to grow to 25% of the population by 2030. We have to give the dignity to our, our seniors and allow them to age in place, to have them be able to give up their cars so that they can walk, bike, and use transit. And speaking of transit, transit and accessibility to transit was one of the key objectives. Broward County Transit's currently working on their Primo plan, their premium mobility plan, and they're looking at things like light rail and bus rapid transit, but also improving accessibility to their transit stops and stations. 
Climate change, as you know, carbon emissions is a major contributor of climate change and air pollution. If we become more multimodal and we re replace just one of our trips with walking or biking, in the long run, we could really curb some of these emissions that are going out today. And transportation options, right? If all of us drove our cars, the roadways would constantly be congested, there'd be air pollution, and this is just unacceptable and it's un unsustainable, really. So providing transportation options isn't only sustainable, but it's the right thing to do, right? Because there's folks that are older that can't drive. There's folks with a disability that can't drive. And then there's children, children who walk and bike to school, or maybe they, they don't walk and bike to school today, but they would like to walk and bike to school and providing folks with options for transportation is fair and just. <clears throat> and then finally, right of way is public land. It's the largest public land in the nation. And today it's allocated mostly primarily for motor vehicles. You know, we've got to level out the playing field and provide facilities for people walking, for people biking, for people using mobility devices and transit. So let's talk about health and wellness. The built environment does influence a person's physical activity. So if we make it difficult to walk and bike, then people are gonna keep choosing their vehicles. But if we provide them with options, then maybe we'll get them to walk and bike more. Obesity has increased in the last decade. Heart disease, cancer, and COVID-19 are the top three causes of death in the United States today. Air pollution to poor cardiovascular health, respiratory health, and brain health, and it also, also leads to low birth weights. Exercising just 30 minutes a day can reduce the risk of developing a mental health condition, but it could also reduce your risk of any one of these diseases that can affect you. The graphic on the screen shows you the effects of walking three minutes up to 90 minutes. Blood pressure decreases, mood improves, creative thinking improves, blood sugar levels decreases, it helps you lose weight, and it reduces the risk of developed heart disease. So now that we've kind of gone over an overview of the project, let's talk about the existing conditions. Some key findings I wanna highlight for you all. Less than 5% of the county population travel to work by walking, biking, or transit today. 30% of the county residents are not physically active. That's a pretty substantial number. Residents today are cost burden. 66% of their income is going to housing and transportation. And the national average is supposed to be about 45%. The transportation network, let's face it, it's not designed for people walking and biking. Rather, it was designed to accommodate motor vehicles at peak hour conditions, so our roadways are essentially designed to accommodate cars for four hours a day. Broward ranks 14th nationally as the most dangerous metropolitan statistical area in the nation and is one of the top three counties here in Florida, leading the state in serious injuries and death by walking or biking. 60% of bicycle and pedestrian crashes occur on roadways with speed limits of 40 miles an hour or higher. And what we found as well is that Fort Lauderdale Plantation, Hollywood and Pompano had the most people killed or ser seriously injured over the last five years while walking or biking. So we've done some outreach events and some focus groups. And so on the screen, you can see a number of comments that kept reoccurring. That we need more shade, that driving is stressful, that we need a physical barrier between motor vehicle traffic and bike lanes, and that riding in the bike lanes don't feel safe, that we need better connectivity, that the sidewalks and the bike lanes are not well maintained, and that bike trails are not as widely accessible as they would want them to be. And people want amenities. They want splash pads and trees and benches and better lighting. And they want more crosswalks and safer crosswalks and enough time to cross, especially for older folks and people 
with a disability. So when we, will, when we look at the county demographics, you can see on the screen here, 76% of the county today drives alone. 22% of the population is under 17 years of age. Right now, 18% is over 65, but as I mentioned to you earlier, it's expected to increase to 25% by 2030. And 7% of households today do not have a car. So when you look at these statistics, and, or yes, the statistics, and you add them together, it's roughly 50% of the population that either can't drive, don't drive, or don't have access to a car. Part of our, our analysis was reviewing existing plans, guidance, and documents. And our team has read dozens of plans at the state, regional, and municipal level, especially as it relates to transportation and mobility. When we looked at the crash data, this map on the screen represents the 6,700 or so crashes that have occurred in the last five years. And you can see the, almost the entire county is covered in purple, meaning that there was a, a, an accident with a bicyclist or a pedestrian. And the lighter the colors, the more intense those crashes happen in the, those areas. So when we looked at the cities, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, Pompano Beach, Pembroke Pines, Davie, Coral Springs, all had 5% or more of these crashes. And then when we look at the pedestrians that have been seriously injured or killed, you can see it's still all over the county, unfortunately, but now we see some hot spots, right? This line right down the middle, that's State Road 7, 441. It's a heavy transit corridor and there's always a lot of people walking and biking along that corridor. And as you can see from the map, it is covered in red and white dots because of the intensity of how many people have been killed walking or biking or seriously injured. And then you'd see the, blob, the red blob in the middle there, that's Fort Lauderdale, Oakland Park area. And then of course, Pompano Beach, Plantation, Hollywood, Davie, West Park, all of these areas have been seriously impacted by people being killed or seriously injured walking or biking. Fort Lauderdale, Plantation, and then Pompano Beach and Hollywood tied in third place uh, for the cities that had the highest rates of people getting killed or seriously injured when walking or biking. When we look at disadvantaged communities, and these are communities that have been historically marginalized, people of color. And that, that is depicted in that tan color on the map. And then we overlaid the people that have been killed or seriously injured while walking or biking. You can see the correlation. The, the darker color represents the more intense accidents or crashes of people being killed. Nationally, Native Americans and Black or African Americans are three to four times more likely to be killed while walking. This is unacceptable. So we did a, a bicycle level of traffic stress analysis. And this is the map that resulted. And you can see from the map that most of the roadways in Broward County were identified as a level of traffic stress four, meaning that it's not very comfortable, right? People that are often using these facilities um, are doing so at their, not only their own risk, but they're doing so because they're either a hardcore cyclist or they have to. And in order to reach this analysis, we use several different criteria, facility type present or the type of facility present, the posted speed limit, the number of traffic lanes, and the average annual daily traffic to provide us with the results that you see on the screen. And for those of you online, we do have an online web viewer map so that you can zoom into this in more detail and check out the roads in your communities. And then when we did this for the pedestrian facilities, the sidewalks and shared use pathways, Similar um, type of analysis, but it, it looks at whether there is a sidewalk present on one or both sides. 
and the separation between motor vehicles and the sidewalk. And you can see from the map that most of the facilities in the county have a level of traffic stress two, which is acceptable, right? These are, these are the facilities that most people feel comfortable using. And then the purple color, just so you all know, uh, it means that there is no sidewalk present. So now that I've gone over uh, a very quick overview of the existing conditions, let's talk about the needs assessment, which is in progress. Our needs assessment includes several tasks. So identifying gaps and opportunities, developing a prioritization criteria, coming up with recommendations, identifying funding opportunities, and then creating a, a cost feasible and a vision plan of projects and prioritizing this plan. So in order to get there, our team is currently conducting what's called a destination accessibility analysis. And this is a preview of the pedestrian accessibility analysis. And what it does is it takes that level of traffic stress analysis that we, we talked about just a few minutes ago, but it looks at prioritized destinations, schools, parks, jobs, transit, and grocery stores. And our team did an analysis of each one of these destinations and then combined it for a total accessibility score. And so the, the warmer colors, the orange and the red, means that those roadways were a high level of, they rated a high level of traffic stress for pedestrian facilities. And then the orange means low access, right? So low accessibility to schools, parks, transit jobs, grocery stores, while the red represents high access, high access to schools, parks, jobs, transit, grocery stores. And then you've got the lighter, or excuse me, warmer or cooler colors, the blue and the green, meaning they had a low level of traffic stress. So that level of traffic stress score one or two. And then the blue means low accessibility to these destinations, and the green means high accessibility to these destinations. So we've definitely got some work to do here, especially out west where a lot of the facilities have, yeah, they have a low uh, level of traffic stress, but they also have a low accessibility score. And once we finalize this, we'll, we'll be putting this on the project webpage for you all to take a look at. Um, but once we do finalize this, our team will then go into a future accessibility analysis where they look at all the planned and programmed bike ped improvements over the next five years. And from there, we'll be able to identify missing gaps and links. So I almost forgot, but we had Slido. So let's get our first Slido question in. So some people came in after we gave the number. Okay, so if you just joined us, slido.com, you're going to type in pound. 2001504. And I'll give you all a second to join in. So our first question, would you like to see an interconnected system of sidewalks, trails, shared use pathways, and bike facilities throughout Broward County. We'll give you all a few minutes to go ahead and answer that question. Again, the question is, would you like to see an interconnected system of sidewalks, trails, shared use pathways, and bike facilities here in Broward County? So far, we have 100% said yes. Shall we move on?
We have another question for you. You guys ready? In your opinion. Oh, okay. I get it. In your opinion, rank which modes of transportation should be prioritized from highest, so top priority, to lowest, bottom priority. <laughs> All right, I know a few folks just joined. If you're just joining us, please log into slido.com. The information is provided in the chat box. And we're currently asking some questions. In your opinion, which modes of transportation should be prioritized from top to bottom? First priority to fifth priority. We'll give you folks another 15 seconds or so to answer. So far we have walking, number one, public transit, number two, bicycling, number three, shared mo mobility devices, bike share, scooter share, e-bikes, e-scooters, And then fifth, emerging mobility. Again, those are your e-bikes and e-scooters, unicycles, those devices. Are we ready to move on? Do you want to do more questions? Sure. We'll do one more question. You're just joining us, slido.com. Pound 2001504. -0 Please select your level of comfort if you're interested or able to bicycle. Again, please select your level of comfort if you're interested or able to bicycle. So 60% said that they fall into the interested but concerned group. 29% fall into the somewhat confident group. And 6% fall into the highly confident group. These are your Lycra cyclists. And then, then another 6% that said that they are, are not physically able to do so. Oh, oh, got some adjustment here. Now it's 11% that say not able. All right, let's continue the presentation. Make sure you guys are alive, paying attention. Do I have to share my screen again? All right, so now that we talked about the accessibility analysis, let's talk about the prioritization criteria. And this is under draft, so if you guys have better ideas, definitely let us know. But these are seven categories we're looking at for prioritization. Safety, connectivity, comfort, equity, health, demand potential, environment, and resiliency. And we've got several items that we can utilize data points right that we can utilize to measure and prioritize projects and we want to do this so that we can prioritize projects get them set up for funding and implementation 
of low stress facilities. So next steps. We're just starting to begin collaboration and coordination on a design manual. And so our design manual is gonna look at best practices, branding, placemaking, and it's gonna create a placemaking toolkit for all the municipalities here in Broward. And on the, on the screen, I've got some illustrations of what placemaking is. And placemaking is essentially the, the community coming together and creating a sense of place. Right, we do that through public law art, we do that through aesthetics, landscaping, trees, integration of nature. Um, we do that by reorienting or restructuring public spaces. And you can see on that screen on the screen here, um, people have taken back part of the road, they've painted it, they've designated that this is my space, this is the space that I get to walk and bike, sit and enjoy and watch people and be social. And the photo in the middle showing a separated bike lane going behind a bus stop and it, there's trees and landscaping and wide sidewalks and parking for bicyclists. And it looks like a, a walkable, friendly environment. And then here in, in downtown Fort Lauderdale, if you haven't seen this art installation, uh, please do so. It's at the near the river front. River walk, sorry, river walk. Um, it's a beautiful piece of art, and I know every time I go there, I see lots of people taking photos. So essentially what our design manual is going to do, we're going to build off of what's already existing. So there's already some design manuals, the complete streets design manual that the Broward MPO did. There's also the one that Deerfield Beach did in Pompano Beach, and we want to build off of the success of those manuals and incorporate best practices. We wanna incorporate multimodal level of traffic stress, standards, guidelines, policies for the municipalities to provide their part into the network. So next steps, we've got a public survey. If you haven't taken our survey, please take your time to take the survey. It's about 15 or 20 minutes. It gets into the nitty gritty. It asks you what facilities look safe and comfortable for you, depending on the street type, as well as questions about walking and biking and what creates a safe, comfortable, convenient walk or bike for you. Uh, we do have, for those of you in attendance, we do have some iPads so that you can take the survey here. We also have some QR codes on the table that will take you to the survey. On the screen, this is a snapshot of what our project webpage looks like. And right at the top, you can see the survey link. I strongly encourage you to check in with our webpage. It, it will be updated monthly. And tonight we're going to test run our crowdsource map. So uh, Justine, if you could drop in that crowdsource map link into the, the chat box. And then we also have the level of traffic stress analysis available on the web viewer. For those of you that are interested in looking at the level of traffic stress for bicyclists and pedestrians, please note that you will have to click the layers on and off for bicyclist level of traffic stress and pedestrian level of traffic stress. This Saturday, we're gonna be in Pembroke Pines at the Touch a Truck event from 10 to 12. Come say hi if you're there. Uh, next month, we're going to the Complete Streets Advisory Committee to talk to them about the project, give them an update, and hopefully get some feedback and guidance for this design manual. And then we'll come back to you most likely in January for our second public meeting, and we'll present to you a draft of the final plan, the final um, toolkits, and the final design manual. So at this time, we are going to start our public comment period. For those of you online, please utilize your chat box. Drop your questions, your comments, your ideas, your feedback into that chat box, please. Members of our project team will respond. And I'd like to remind you all that questions or comments are welcome throughout the process. This is the critical time to get your questions and comments in though. Um, but we, 
as anticipate wrapping this up about March, early 2024. So for those of you here in person, you're gonna have the opportunity to come up, ask your question, you'll be given two minutes. And then once everybody here in person has asked questions, we will then swap over and tend to the, the online chat box. Our project website, the link is on the screen for you. And this presentation will be available on the project website in the next week or so. If after this meeting, you think of something you have a great idea, you see something while riding your bike or walking or driving. Our project email, lowstressplan at marlinengineering.com. I check that email about once a week and I will respond to your questions and queries and comments. And then here's a shortened bit.ly link for our project webpage. It is case sensitive. And finally, please follow map Broward on Instagram and Facebook for updates. Thank you. All right. Who is the first person to come up and ask your question? Oh, we can go then. <laughs> Would anyone like to ask a question? Yes. Can you please take the name and the city? Yes. Joe in from Plantation. My question really is that, I mean, like right now, Tamarack is doing their post stress multimodal mobility network master plan meeting as well. Uh, Plantation is planning theirs. What is in a program like this that is ensuring that these are all coordinated so they all occur essentially at the same time? and not overlap with budgets and concerns and property rights and other things like that. Essentially, so that we can get things done, but without dealing with individual city concerns because we have them all involved at once. I can take first stab at that. Um, Go for it, Jeff. Wagner with Marlin Engineering. Can you summarize you the know, question? This, excuse me? Summarize the question. I think you were asking, and it's Joe Wynn, right, from Plantation. We met previously at another public hearing. But, um, you know, this project is funded by Broward County. Um, and municipalities in Broward County uh, are moving forward and have their own plans. One of these initiatives, are, especially in developing the design manual, is to create something that every city can use as a template. Um, it's to encourage consistency and conformity. Uh, I think hearing from the public about having connected facilities that are consistent. Every city can have their own design, but we need to have the touch and feel and the branding that Broward County is accessible, east, west, north, south. Uh, you don't have to put your bike in a car to ride to a park to dare to ride a bike, but um, you know, through county leadership, uh, we are encouraging consistency across the county. Anyway. Could you name the city that took one? Sure. So I'm Max Holstein. I'm also from Plantation. Uh, I don't have a question, but I do have a couple of comments. The first is that I, I worry that there might be too much emphasis on greenways and trails, which are mainly mm -hmm. recreational facilities. And there should be much more emphasis placed on, you know, protected on-street bike lanes because, you know, of course people want to have recreation. They want to bike and walk for exercise. But that's not most of people's trips. Most people just want to get to the post office, go grocery shopping, and if we give them the opportunity to be connected from their home to the shopping areas, to uh, their friends, to their neighbors, that, that will get a lot more use out of it, much more bang for our buck. Uh, Thank you for your comment. Um, actually, this plan is prioritizing utilitarian travel. So this is uh, not prioritizing recreational travel. 
This is specifically to get to destinations exactly like you're saying. So we want to make sure that, especially when we were doing our accessibility analysis, the essential locations, parks, schools, grocery stores, places of business, um, jobs, so on and so forth. So I'm hoping that this plan will specifically address your concerns. So I just was going to add, if you remember on one of the slides, 60% of the fatalities and serious injuries are occurring on roadways at 40 miles per hour. And you know, safety is number one. Sorry, maybe take a break. But uh, my second comment was that, you know, transportation doesn't occur in a vacuum because land use is the other half of the equation. So it's not just connecting people, it's bringing them closer together to their destinations and, and making it easier to get to places. So, for example, making a recommendation that cities, you know, don't allow parking spaces between the bike lane and the building or making the sidewalk be flush with whatever building is on the street. So things like that. Thank you for your comment. And I, I think that your comment is just, uh, directing um, specifically towards bicycling. So I'll go ahead and say that the, the goal of this project is really to be able to look at context, so whether you're urban or suburban, um, and to also look at what the roadway conditions are. Are you on a major arterial? Are you on um, a collector on your way to a major arterial or, or state road? Um, and we want to make sure that we're putting the right facility for the right place. So these analysis will be um, will be conducted, and the design manual will reflect um, opportunities that would create that low stress condition that I think that you all want, um, and it'll respond to those different elements. So, for example, while a five foot bike lane on Broward Boulevard may not be comfortable because it has very high traffic volume and has a, a good number of travel lanes. A bike lane on a local road, a collector, might be more appropriate because the speed's lower, there's less um, vehicles traveling on there, and it's a lower, lower speed and lower volume um, and a more appropriate location for, say, a bike foot bike lane. So we'll be looking at all these different opportunities and you know, that's part of the reason why we have this public survey is we really want to be able to see what's comfortable for you all, whether it's walking or biking. And this will be adapted into our design manual and hopefully be something that we can implement. Yeah, I think your comment was spot on. Uh, land use is part of the answer. And, you know, making recommendations for changes to land development codes. Again, all of the cities have their own codes. But speaking from a pedestrian point of view, I really appreciate what has happened in Fort Lauderdale. The supermarkets require a pedestrian access to the neighborhood behind it instead of having a wall. And I use it all the time. And, and you know, what an idea. Let's have the people from the neighborhood walk across the street instead of having to go on a six lane arterial to get to the supermarket. That's part of the connectivity but institutionalizing land use and land development codes are a part of the answer. Yeah. Um, we have a question online. Um, Do you want to read it? Sure. We have a question in the chat that reads, um, Elaine Franklin, how does this initiative connect with Broward County's existing bike mobility plan? Mm -hmm. In Hollywood, for example, the city and county have already added some bike lanes but they could be more inviting to use if they're upgraded mm -hmm. to buffered or separated lanes and will probably be used more. Does this initiative provide the opportunity for that? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, first of all, um, we have reviewed all of the official documents in Broward County. Frankly, I'm not familiar with the title mentioned here, but we will record it into the record. Oh, I thought it's just in the Broward County. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this goes to the, the question we previously had about each of the communities having their own plans. Um, you know, it, it's time to bring these plans together. Um, we've done a comprehensive review of every city's plans, and that'll be part of the existing analysis of gaps and connectivity. 
Uh, I think I would mention to the second half of the question, right of way is an issue. And sometimes you just can't fit what you need to fit, but priorities need to change too. It's that to accommodate the pedestrians and the bicycle first, and then have constrained automobile facility. But the question will be taken into the record and we can provide follow up. Uh, and the project manager does that would like to mention something. So we have a question about how does this plan interrelate to the Safe Streets for All grant our uh, region just received? So there is a federal grant that Broward County and Broward MPO uh, received this $5 million grant for a um, What is MPO stands for? A Metropolitan Planning Organization mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're a regional transportation planning agency. Do you want to let them know what, what they do? The Broward MPO? Huh? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So the Metropolitan Planning Organization is uh, a federal requirement to receive and to Distribute. any federal dollar for transportation has to be in the 25 plus year plan developed by 75% of the community's elected official. And you can't spend one federal dollar without being in the MPO's plan. I would suggest all of you to get active with the MPO and review their long range transportation plan. Broward County is a very progressive MPO and they do prioritize non motorized facilities. So the question was, how does it, how does the uh, Safe Streets for All um, grant interrelate with this project? So this project, the Low Stress Multimodal Mobility Network Master Plan is acting as match to this five million dollar grant that we received that will produce a safety action plan for all of our counties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew McIntosh, uh, Plantation. Uh, I was kind of curious with highways, there's not an expectation to be able to ride a bike or walk on like I-95 and Florida term five. You never see that before. So not a lot. Crazy. So I wonder if there was a template that cities can, if there's a plan for a template for kind of getting the downtown of cities like Fort Lauderdale or like Plantation to have like the opposite where there's only the expectation to be able to access the area with a car uh, where it's only, you can only access like certain parts of the city with kind of bike or public transit or walking, but like no access to cars whatsoever. <laughs> Europe does that. I'm not coming down to Toronto Pass. So there are uh, many ways. Jeff, you want to summarize a question for the folks online? Uh, yeah, I, don't, I think I understood. Which part of your like, a car, like a car, is it, car is free zone. Template car free zone. For a car free zone in downtown areas where this heavy. Um, I, I might let you get into that part of the question, but I did want to mention that, you know, the interstates create barriers, physical barriers, and they've separated neighborhoods. And um, if you look at some of the streets that are underpasses, that aren't interchanges, it's dark, it's dirty, there's hidden places. If you Google and you look at underpasses as art, or other communities have created public space. If you see the picture in the middle, the new Cistrunk Boulevard underpass that they widened as part of 95, they actually put in really bright lighting because frankly, you don't feel safe when you're underneath there. And the interchanges, the pedestrian bicycle facilities under 95 are uncomfortable and inconvenient. So I want to thank you for your question um, related to car-free zones. So while car-free zones are something that we could create as a recommendation within um, the, the master plan overall, it would be up to the municipalities themselves um, to decide whether they wanted to implement it. And the challenges with that is it really depends on who owns the roadway as well. Um, so that would have to be carefully implemented. Um, other strategies that we could do to implement car free zones are, for example, like greenways or trails um, and create really robust interactive places 
such as um, Fort Lauderdale's Riverwalk, which is a car-free area. Um, and there's a lot more development that's going up that has um, storefronts right directly off of the Riverwalk. So those are opportunities for car-free zones. Um, and I think that that would come down to the municipal um, decision making for what their uh, land use and zoning looks like and how they implement urban design. But it's certainly a recommendation that we can take and add into our master plan. And um, hopefully in the future we can see something like a Lincoln Road. <laughs> One more question in the chat. A um, question from Mr. James Musters. Have you considered bicycle arterials, a road that gets bikes from one place to another where on that street or route, bicycles are the priority. Cars would yield to bicycles. I think he's talking about the question board. Absolutely, they're being considered. Um, Could you repeat the question? Yes. Have you? Do we have a mic? No. Nope, that works. Okay, so repeating the question Have you considered bicycle arterials, a road that gets bikes from one place to another, where on that street or route, bicycles are the priority? Cars would yield to bicycles. So I believe that is referring to neighborhood greenways and bicycle boulevards. And yes, we will be looking at those type of treatments. I hope that answers your question. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, we have. Oh, look, we have all sorts of questions over here on the floor. Let's go to this gentleman back here who has been patiently waiting. Thank you, sir. Presentation. Also, would like to have access to some of the things that I hear being mentioned here. So, my question is what plans are there for the, the blind person who wants to walk and just need to walk from the, the neighborhood to the store across the street? How will this plan? Uh, Assist someone like myself. Thank you for your question. So one of the key pillar principles of our, our master planning process is inclusivity. And so we're looking things like at things like universal design or inclusive design that accommodates people that have a disability. So for folks like yourself who are blind and you can't see, best practices to utilize a facility while walking and using their their uh, assistant equipment. I believe you mentioned in your presentation walking on the sidewalk. I was trying that once on my own and there was a crack on the sidewalk and I ended up inside. So these are concerns that people that myself have. Understood. Understood. Are there are there any amenities that you're finding yourself really wanting, or any changes that you're finding you're saying, if if only this thing could change, my life would be a lot easier when I'm not in the boat. Yes, for all the instructions, like you're going across, and you get to a spot where you can press a button and it speaks, or you're getting closer and hear it. That has a sensor and say, you know, at this location, it speaks and directs you from there. Press button in front of you, something like that. I think the points from talking to Nikki at the beginning of the meeting, and some of the things, you know, he, he believes the audible um, signals work and they work well. He believes the tactile pads are big enough. I thought they might need to be a little bit bigger. But one thing is finding the push button and, and the need to have a detection device that somebody is in near the intersection and then again using the beeping so that 
he can find the button. Other questions? My name is David. I live in Oakland Park. And uh, I saw a billboard referencing the Primo plan and uh, rapid transit specifically on Oakland Park Boulevard. So I looked that up, very exciting. I'm wondering uh, how that and my something like this, yeah. just for example, I wrote my bike down Oakland Park Boulevard just last week, all the way to the oceanfront and then up to a lot of places I think. So the bike lanes along the oceanfront were very nice, separated, but separated. But going down Oakland Park Boulevard itself was very scary. I actually just rode on the sidewalk the whole way. Um, even though there are signs that say bikes can share the road. So I'm wondering as we look to in the uh, rapid transit lanes, the bus rapid transit lanes, is that going to change like the bike infrastructure or is that going to speak to, to, to this plan? Thank you for your question. Um, so Broward County Transit is a steering committee member. Um, we have a steering committee group that provides technical assistance and guidance through this process. We've met with them twice already and we're getting ready to meet with them again. Um, but they, we are coordinating with the county, we're coordinating with FDOT, we're coordinating with the Broward NPO and um, other agencies as well. So I, I do understand that Primo is going on and, and the study for that is, is ongoing and we have re reviewed the technical documents that, that have been released as part of our process. Um, so keep in mind these, these plans are being developed right for years down the road and it's not necessarily going to happen tomorrow or next year, but they're going to happen in several years. So, um, you know, coordinating our recommendations and improvements will kind of happen as we continue collaborating with uh, Broward County Transit and other stakeholders. Yeah, access to transit is definitely a, a, an underlying premise of this effort. Um, you know, we strongly that crashes, serious injuries, and fatalities for pedestrians can be related to the location of bus stops. Um, people tend to follow a desire line. I want to cross the street here. Uh, in the morning, if you're going to miss your bus, people take chances to catch the bus. But access to transit, safe access to transit, is an underlying principle of this project. Hi, uh, Alejandro Munoz. Um, I'm uh, from Baby. And my question is regarding uh, road diets. If road diets are being considered for um, for this plan, uh, seeing as most of our arterials are becoming six lanes, um, how would that work with accommodating bicycle facilities, protected bicycle facilities, and wider sidewalks? Um, yeah, that's my question. So lane repurposing, low road diets, complete streets, different names. But um, you know, uh, all streets need to be for all modes. Um, this is fruit and some successes around the community. I'll have to say it to be a paradigm shift. Even the public, getting more people involved, getting more people to and support this philosophy that this is what the public wants and, and you know we need your help to, to expand exponentially please share the survey with your friends with your networks we need numbers and uh, and your support thank you for your question um also from plantation um on that note since you were talking about like a lot of involvement what can we do as citizens that to like help get this stuff across the finish line help get support for the road diets help get this stuff like moving i mean you guys have a really great really fast timeline which is refreshing um but what can we do i'm looking across the room everybody's pretty young uh, social media Friends, networks, I believe your name was Peter, sir, the gentleman here. 
Jacob, I'm sorry. <laughs> so many first things. But you heard about the meeting through Reddit. Uh, uh, Discord. The Discord. However, you can expand the communication. Our survey is electronic. We have a crowdsource map. You can drop a pin. We want to hear places about where you believe there were challenges. You're not safe. You don't feel comfortable. It's not inclusive. And then places you think there are some successes, and there are successes around the county, some really great places to be, but they're not connected. And um, please share with your friends and ask them to share with others. And to, to add to what Jeff was saying, get involved. Um, you've got your professionals at the local level, right? Your commissioners. These are the folks that are making decisions on land use, on the roadways, on the zoning. Um, you know, for, so for your city, you got to get involved locally, and then for, for regional, right? The Powered MPO is a great resource. They have technical advisory committees that you can volunteer for and assist, right? Technical advice, citizens advisory committee, excuse me. The citizens, the CAC citizens advisory committee is specifically aimed for the community. They meet, um, what is it, monthly or? or yeah, so 10 times a year, so typically every month, and it's always open to the public. You can go in and, and state your concerns, your desires, your questions, your comments. Um, that is a great avenue to take, especially for transportation. Hi, uh, Matthew McIntosh, Plantation. Um, I want to know if the, I, this uh, organization is able to make kind of recommendation to open up funding for the pedestrianization of streets. I know some of the I know some of the funding that's available for infrastructure it has to be used to accommodate cars. And I was just curious if there was like a way to like at least put the recommendation that out there to free up that money to be used uh, for like. You know, public transit, bike lanes, new sidewalks, protected bike lanes, of course, so on and so forth. Well, follow the money. <laughs> um, there are different pots of money from different jurisdictions. At the local level, you have your local option gas tax funding. Frankly, nationwide, it's going down. We are electrifying our automobile network. Um, Broward County has moved forward with the penny surtax that Josette can talk about. And then there's state of Florida funding, which has a significant pot of money. And then there's the federal government. And a couple of years ago, the Infrastructure and Investment in Jobs Act was passed with $2 trillion worth of money for projects. But priorities need to change. And we need to have a strong voice to make that change. And I just want to add to that um, with the safe streets and roads for all grant that we received, the federal grant for five million dollars, which will create a safety action plan. This will allow us to be eligible to go after implementation grants in future rounds. And so we are really hoping to leverage federal funds to do a lot of really good implementations that will increase safety and provide safer conditions for people walking, biking, but also people who choose to ride motorcycles and even those who drive or use transit. We're going to take, let's say, two more questions so we can break out and um, you can provide comments on the board guys. Yeah. Hey, so uh, before this list gets out of control, um, I commuted here on bicycle, obviously, uh, and then changed in the bathroom. I commute everywhere since I Rode a bicycle across the country by myself in 2010. Um, aside from flying around the country, around the world where I've worked, uh, I've worked in city planning and marketing uh, for over a decade, and uh, um, primarily in filmmaking. So my biggest issue. Oh, I'm from Plantation. My name is Jesse Scanlon, like everyone else. Yeah. If it wasn't Plantation, I'd be taking the bus. Um, so I don't own a vehicle. And my biggest issue, uh, my biggest concern is that um, we seem to be only defensive 
in terms of providing you know accessibility when I think it the idea should be putting funding money into um, encouraging people not to buy the SUVs, not to buy the huge trucks that my entire neighborhood has one in every single driveway. And that's climate change aside. It's like uh, consider the fact that um, tons of kids die every year just from parents backing over them because they drive the vehicle is too large. Um, there's that. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to speed through this. Oversight on projects currently underway and oversight for this, whatever this potential project may be. I mean, I just wrote over here where there's no sidewalk at all. The first five that has been underway for three, four years in view. The no oversight in terms of that kind of spending. Uh, plantation invested, I think, about a million parking lot over there by that soccer field, um, which is awesome, you know, 500 spots for So uh, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate the fact about 60% of fatalities occur on roadways that are 40 miles per hour or more. You should consider the fact that no one follows speed limits. And so therefore, on Peter's Road, where they be like a huge side of the um, People are flying down, going like 50, 60 miles an hour, all day long, no cop presence. Um, I actually crashed there when I was 17 because there wasn't drainage of the hydroplane and crashed into a tree. So um, there's oversight, there's what we're doing in terms of budget, um, targeting lower socioeconomic areas. Um, and which obviously brings the question um, those who are, um, what's the term, um, discriminated upon um, in terms of their socioeconomic status. Um, I, I took a ride from uh, Cypress Creek to here, and you know, Google Maps had me take the back ways and. And I, I felt pretty safe, except for the roads, the conditions, terrible. Like, I mean, there's potholes everywhere. And uh, which brings me to my next question is, is what, um, what jurisdiction do you guys even have when we're in a, in a county with like 50 municipalities? <laughs> like, which, which streets are you guys allowed to work on without, you know, this city or that city saying, you know, you can't. You can't put my lanes here, you know, because we need that room for our trucks, you know. Um, I'm sorry to continue, but I just want to get this over with. Uh, the Broward County Transit app, terrible issues. Um, oh, and uh, the Greenway, which I understand was, you know, a hugely funded project along 585 to answer this question, I guess, um, is awesome. I use it occasionally, uh, except for the fact that right here, you literally have to go across to the other side of 585 and then right on the street like on 84 to get to Davy Road and then wait forever because the light never changes and then go back to the other side of 585 because there's a private community called the island over here in plantation that I, that I guess did not give you guys so many privileges to, to, to build a whatever thing there. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any plan to circumvent that issue. Um, my mom also actually sent questions. She's like, she's blowing me up. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, my mom, who is one of the administrators for a thousand member women's biking group, uh, is asking, she's checking out me now. Um, you guys should have had this better, first off. I only saw this last night, in the middle of the night, scrolling through Reddit. Um, whoever posted that, thank you. Um, was that you? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, and and as someone who's a, a pretty you know serious advocate for this kind of stuff and who you know tells stories and and would like to you know tell a good story about Broward County, um, I'd show up. Uh, my mom's only comment, uh, comment was. What 
Okay, if there's a mic from biking, uh, being to fix a bike path between the university and Chicago, yeah, I already addressed that. Uh, also, build bridges on the greenway so that people don't have to cross the area just yet. Uh, hold a debacle on 441, trying to find a trail. It's shameful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she, she had like a horror story with my stepfather and we were yelling at each other. Um, anyway, so pedestrian signals, uh, uh, need improvement. So to add to what you're saying, just it, it, I'm just, I'm, I, I, I know. I know. <laughs> well, well uh, just like I'm taking notes, I hope you guys are taking notes as well. So uh, to add to what he's saying, I mean, I, I live in Gainesville, Florida for about eight years, and there they have pedestrian signals that in, in the push button it says loudly, please wait, or walk, or this is the street, you know? Uh, I think that would be helpful. Um, I'll cut it there. Yeah, so too many questions to answer and, and take up all of your time, but we will respond to each of your questions. I think we'll need to sit down with you and, and jot them down. We'll give you a business card and then we can respond to each of your questions, okay? I think there was one more hand up. Jacob. Yes. Hang on, Jacob. Hello, I go by Good Citizen. Uh, I reside in West End and I work in Tamarack and Sun River. I have two areas of comments. The first one is like a general comment where I want to put into record that I support protected bike lanes, robust pedestrian infrastructure, bigger sidewalks, curb bump outs, crosswalks, etc., rapid bus transit, light rail, dedicated bus lanes, bus islands, and I support narrowing of streets in a corporate sense. The second uh, issue I have was as I was coming to this government uh, building, on both entrances, I saw prominent signs that said, no biking, no scootering, no sidewalk, which is ironic at a government facility where I came to advocate for public transport, that even in a government building and government property, signs are like, no bikes, no sidewalk, skateboards, no scooters, etc. Um, as long as of you know skateboards and stuff. A lot of people in this uh, meeting are talking about bicycles, but I myself, you know, I am more of a skateboarder. And almost everywhere I go in Broward County, it's like pro bike pretenders always signs and stuff that say no skateboarding here. This is not the 1980s and 90s where you know skateboarders are for the lungs or whatever. The skateboards now are electrified, they're longboard, they're able to get you further distances. Um, and I wanted, uh, I had an issue um, during COVID earlier in uh, 2020 where I was trying to skateboard in a bike lane and the cop pulled me over and says, you're not allowed to bike in this lane. But I, you know, I had to argue that my skateboard is not your regular skateboard that's slow. This one's gonna go fast. It's meant to keep up with bicycles and pedestrian, you know, cars and stuff. So I want to see more um, uh, policies that go against, you know, help claw at cities that are putting up these ordinances that say no biking, no, you know, scooter, no skateboard, because the fact is. We need more multimodal modes of transport. And yeah, that's my that cutting off there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Again, I, I encourage all of you guys and gals to take our online survey. It specifically addresses things like skateboarding and biking and unicycling and electric scooters. Um, we want to incorporate these devices into our master planning process here. Um, so please provide your input, submit your comments, um, get involved. So at this time, we'll, we'll open up for our open house. Uh, for those of you online, the meeting, um, the cross source map is available. And also we have a survey, please take it.
At this time, we'd like to invite Lorelai Kitchen to unmute herself if you would like to add any closing remarks related to county efforts. Sorry, I, I missed the, the question. Hi, Mila. Um, the question is, would you like to offer any closing remarks regarding the county's efforts on county-owned roads, which may be relevant since we've received a lot of questions about what we can do inside of cities so that we can just provide some clarity of the different jurisdictions for the roads regarding state, county, and city? Um, yeah, our efforts uh, for the in-house design team for Brow County is that we're focusing on providing bicycle lanes and bicycle facilities and better walking areas for pedestrians. Um, we're also helping a municipality uh, provide that for their roadways. And we're also working with state agencies to um, improve their roadways. Thank you, Lila. Oh, Lila, can you state your title, please, with the county? Yes, uh, my my title is uh, engineering su uh, supervisor. Um, I work with different agencies, um, coordinating projects, uh, prioritizing uh, mobility for different users, bicycle um, lanes and sidewalks for for different um, road roadways for city roadways, county roadways, and state roadways. Thank you, Lila. All right, so um, again, if you're online, we've got the crowdsource mask. Please take our public survey, share it with your friends and family, neighbors, coworkers. And then we also have our LTS level of traffic stress maps available for web view, also online. For those of you in person, we do have some tablets and some laptops that you can see. So if you want to check out those maps here, you can. And for those of you who are in person, please check out our aerial maps. You know, identify areas that feel safe, that don't feel safe, or you have maybe suggestions, recommendations, ideas. I just want to mention that um, we need to be out of this room at 9 o'clock, but we have to 8.30. So we have a half an hour to send some one-on-one -on -one time here. I think that plantation board is going to be very popular, but I think it's broken up onto four, four different boards. I invite everybody who is online to continue to ask us questions as we view the different web materials that we have available. Um, we will be sitting and answering your questions. Thank you. Or you can oh, but we're not, we're not speaking to the ones who are sitting outside already are. No, this is us.